We are ready to get going. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. We'll get started in our words for the day. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to study your word. And Father, we ask you to please help us in our studies today that we see what is being said. That we see, Father, how you explain things, how you show things. Because we know, Father, that ultimately, obviously, there is where we need to get our information. Where we need to be uh, right, Father, in the teachings that you give. Um, recognizing that your word, your Bible, are the teachings that you give. Help us, Father, to strive to not allow anything, including our own personal feelings, our own personal beliefs, to get in the way of your word. Help us to understand it, Father, to follow it, to live it. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Ah, good morning, Doris. Good to see you. Okay, today we actually have three words we're going to be looking at. But those three words that we're looking at are all talking about the same person, people, okay? They are words that are oftentimes, depending on what, what religion that you, uh, that you are recognizing, whenever you're doing a study of religions, for instance, they, they are words that are oftentimes used separately, speaking of different people. But we're going to see in God's word that all three of these words speak about the same person, or people in a congregation, all right? They're not talking about different individuals, but the same individuals when they're used. And what that does for us, by the, by the way, this does a very important thing for us, the fact that these three words are used, speaking of the same uh, position within God's kingdom. The, re the reason there it's important to know that is because this tells us what these three, what these people ought to be. These are like three different ways of describing someone. If you were to take one individual and describe him according to his gender, according to his political party, and according to the state he lives in, you know, well, is that three people or one per person you're talking about? You're talking about one person. But you're learning something about them. One of them tells you, tells you, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> what, his, what his political views are oftentimes. One of them will tell you about what his, uh, what his surrounding people are like. I mean, they all tell you something different about the person. Morning, Sherry. Good to see you. Uh, so that's, that's what we're wanting to notice here. Go with me if you will. I want to start right here in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going we're gonna to note something. And first off, the idea that God has given different positions in his church. Okay, different different people with different responsibilities. Now sometimes these responsibilities overlap. I don't want us to I don't want us to uh, to think that well if you're one of these you can't be another one of these. Okay, that's sometimes uh, uh, sadly an argument that people can get in over God's word. Well you can't be both. And that's not true. You can be both. And we're going to notice some examples of people who were both or maybe even three of those things or four of those things okay but it, it does give us this list of positions we're going to be in a, we're going to be down in verse 11 if you're wanting to get get ready for this i'm still gonna, i'm still giving a little bit of introduction to it but paul the apostle in chapter four is telling us about the unity how the church ought to be growing together united together in that growth and the reason he gives these positions, he, he says, as you go on following verse 11, he makes it clear so that you will not be carried away by all doctrines. These are positions in God's church to help the congregation to grow. All right. That's the, that's the most important thing is to recognize the reason for them. Then you discuss, then you discuss what they are. Um, I, by the way, uh, the reason I'm doing this lesson today uh, is, is because of the lesson we had yesterday. Yesterday, we studied about the fact that there is no uh, group higher before Jesus Christ as far as uh, uh, being able to reach God, being able to uh, be holy, holier than anyone else, than the Christian. All right? But all Christians are supposed to be just as holy as God wants them to be, which is, which is we're supposed to be holy because God is holy. All Christians are supposed to be. There is no upper class Christian. All right. Now, again, there are positions in the Lord's church that have responsibilities. And I like to put it that way. 
responsibilities. You're going to see why I'm, I'm putting it that way in, 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 the, in our study. By the way, the words we're looking at today, I don't mean to be keeping you totally in the dark until the last moment. We're looking at the word elder, bishop, and pastor. Those three words speak about the same person, the same position within God's church. Elder, bishop, and pastor. And I'm sure that we can all think of various religions that use one or all of those words, but oftentimes some of them will use them talking about different people. They don't apply to the same person. They are positions almost like a hierarchy that you're moving your way up or something along those lines. And, and that's one thing I want us to notice. That's, that's not at all what God's word is showing. God's word shows that all three of them speak of the same individual. And again, the import of that is not to be intellectually intellectually savvy and be able to tell people, you know, what you're doing is, your ideas are wrong. No. It's so that we can know what this person is supposed to be so that he can do God's job, the job God has given him, the responsibility that God has given him so that he can do it in such a way that will be effective for the growing of God's kingdom. If the only reason we ever we ever learn uh, things from God's word is to show ourselves to be intellectually superior to other people, shame on us. <laughs> That's not a reason for it. In fact, later on within this within that same chapter, Ephesians chapter four, it says, "Speak the truth." In verse fifteen, speak the truth in love. All right. There's the reason we want to share things with people is because of our love of them and our love of God, obviously. Uh, to be able to be to be able to be intellectually superior, to be able to prove people wrong, is a bad attitude. All right, plain and simple. But let's look and see this list first off in verse eleven. Um, only one of those uh, words between elder, pastor, and bishop are used in this verse, and I find that to be very significant. Look at what he says, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Okay, uh, look at the different words, apostle, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I'm obviously not going to cover each and every one of these. I'll, I'll touch them very briefly, perhaps all of them, but I'm not going to cover the meaning of all. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the word pastor. That's what I'm looking at. Notice, notice though, the other ones, apostles. You know, if you want to know the qualifications of an apostle, you can go to the end of Acts chapter 1. An apostle had to be someone who was with Jesus, who heard Jesus' teachings from the time that he started his ministry until the end of it. All right? The, the 12 apostles, including Judas, uh, were of that situation. And, uh, of course, Judas betrayed Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 1, they replaced Judas with someone. But that someone, Matthias, by the way, is who they replaced him with, that someone had to be, have been, heard the teachings, been with the teachings of Jesus Christ from the beginning of his ministry until the end, and, and had, had to have seen the risen Christ. All right? Those, those two requirements for an apostle. So when we talk about that today, of course, we can't have apostles today. There, are no, there is no one who can fit that billing today. All right? So, so we'll go right off of apostle there. Again, sometimes apostle will be used in, uh, in a place equivalent to some of these other ones we're talking about. It's the same thing as, as, some, as this. And obviously, God's idea of what an apostle is cannot be that. Um, now, next, look at the next word, prophets. Don't get caught up on that word prophet. Sometimes, sometimes we think a prophet is someone who speaks by inspiration. Well, there are inspired prophets. But please understand something. The word prophet merely means someone who speaks for another. All right? And I, I don't want you to think I'm getting grandiose thoughts in my head about myself right now. But what I'm doing right now is prophesying. Okay? I'm not speaking for me. I'm wanting to speak about God's word. Anyone who does that is a prophet by the very general sense of the word. There certainly are places in God's word where we see men who are inspired and therefore they are prophets of God. But if you go to the book of Exodus, you come to find out that Aaron was Moses' prophet. 
The word is used that way. I think it's Exodus chapter 7. Uh, God, God tells Moses, I have made you like a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron is your prophet. Well, he's not saying that Moses was a god, and he's not saying that Aaron was speaking by inspiration. He is saying that Moses was going to be over, with authority over Pharaoh, to be able to, to, be able to instruct Pharaoh on what he needs to do, and Aaron was going to speak for Moses from time for Moses from time to time. That's all the word means for prophet. Okay, but there are we always need to look at the context and see specifically what he's talking about. So, in, in some regards, the individual who speaks from the pulpit, uh, I hate to use this this example because people are going to get a wrong idea about what I'm saying. That the person speaking from the pulpit speaks by inspiration. No. I'm saying the per person who speaks in the pulpit needs to be who's speaking before a crowd, whether you read ever whether you have a pulpit or not, whether you have, whether it's in a church building or not, but speaks before a crowd about God, speaks to people about God, is prophesying, is is speaking prophecy, uh, speaking God's word. All right, if you want to say it that way, uh, I know there's probably going to be people out there who's going to get the wrong idea about what I mean by that, but basically a preacher. Is what you're talking about, or anyone else? Because we're all supposed to be preachers to one respect or another. That's another dis discussion. Now the next word, evangelists. This is a specific type of preaching, a specific type of prophesying, if you want to call it that. This is an individual who's going out and teaching the gospel. The, the word here literally means gospel, gospel, or gospel tellers, or or, or gospel people. All right, it's, it's, it's the same form of the word gospel or good news, good news tellers. And so, and so an evangelist is someone who is going out and evangelizing, is trying to, trying to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, uh, Timothy was an evangelist. He also was a preacher. He also was a preacher. All right, he, the, the two words oftentimes do speak about the same person. The person can be both. All right, the person can do both. But, but they are individuals, it, there is a specific meaning of this word. That's why it helps us, as I said a few moments ago, to understand what a, the three different words used for an, el excuse me, an elder are. They'll help us to understand their responsibilities. Then we have the word pastors. We're going to talk about that, obviously, the rest of the study. And the word teachers. All right. Again, a teacher, someone who is teaching others about God. Can you see how some of these words can be just incorporated into the others easily? Obviously, a, a prophet is a teacher. Obviously, an evangelist is a prophet. Uh, you know, pro, you know, speaking speaking for someone else, speaking for God. Okay. Obviously, a teacher. Uh, you know, obviously, a, an apostle is a teacher. He's teaching people. But there are specific positions, specific responsibilities for each one of these. Okay. Any comments on? That verse. Please don't give any additional stuff, any any additional things that we want to consider from other verses at the moment. But any questions or, or points about those group of people? God has always had a plan, and this is his plan we're going to be discussing today right. about the organization of the church, Albert. It's good. Exactly. exactly. And by the way, in one sense, I, I didn't mean to didn't mean to say something that made you think differently. In one sense, we still have the apostles. We have them in their teachings. Okay? Yeah. I'm not trying to say the apostles have no part in our lives today. They do. M many of the teachings of the Bible are, are directly from the apostles. All, also, other of the teachings in the New Testament are because the apostles laid hands on someone and made them an inspired prophet, and they wrote down uh, books of the Bible. You have, you have Luke, for instance. Um, you have uh, Mark, for instance. These are, these are not apostles, but they are inspired prophets of God, prophesying, use, uh, giving inspired inspiration of God's word. Other books of the Bible that were written by people like Jude, the book of Jude, the book of James, is, is we understand not to have been written by, by apostles, but, the, but they were written by men. It's believed they are the brothers of Christ, actually. Doesn't matter who they are, they're inspired, whoever they are. All right. So, Albert, yes, sir. One one thing too that that came to mind in, in going back and reading over some of this these things, 
is that when we're reading Second Peter uh, chapter one verse three, that God gave us God's given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. Yes. He didn't leave anything for us to work out for ourselves. He did, he has given us all instructions. And that includes what we're discussing today. Amen. Amen. Now, let's talk about this word pastor first. But since that's one of the three, that's the, one of those three, those three words, this is the word that is in this, in this particular verse we're in. The word pastor is merely a word for shepherd. Quite frankly, from what I understand, in the old King James days, sometimes the individual who was in the field taking care of sheep was, was called a pastor. He could be called a shepherd as well. The word shepherd is in the in the Bible as well as the word pastor. All right. There's actually one place in the old in the old King James. I wish I would have had that ready for you. I don't have it. But there's one place in the old King James in the Old Testament where it's talking about someone in the field taking care of sheep and the individual is called a pastor. All right. That's all the word is. Understand something. You've heard me say this over and over before. You're going to hear me say this until you're sick of it. Okay. But the words in the Bible are everyday words. They are not religious words. Okay? They're everyday words. Pastor is not a religious word. It, there is a position in God's kingdom that is called a pastor and, and at times. And that tells us something about the position. But it's not a religious word. Okay? And so, and so, you know, uh, we're going to see that in the next two verses we're going to look at that's going to show us the other two words connected with this word pastor. But, the, but a pastor is merely a shepherd. If you want to know the job of a shepherd in God's congregation, go to Psalm 23. <laughs> psalm 23 is a, is a psalm about Jesus and God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he maketh me lie down in green pastures. He he leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. I mean, he goes on through there and speaks of restoring his soul, uh, protecting him in front of his enemies, uh, being with him through the shadow of death. That is the job of a shepherd. It's what a shepherd literally did for his sheep. It's what Jesus literally does for his people. I mean, literally, I guess I shouldn't say literally. He doesn't lead us into grass, grassy fields to eat. Okay, But he, he leads us towards the idea of spiritual nourishment, his word, okay? Delivering us, bringing us towards his word. And so what you see in, the, in, the, in Psalm 23 is talking about Jesus. Please don't let anyone say, Albert says, this is talking about elders. It's not talking about elders. It's talking about Jesus using a common everyday shepherd and what they do for their sheep to show Jesus does the same thing for us spiritually. Well, the same thing is true about shepherds in God's kingdom. The word is used to show what they are supposed to do for God's people. Oftentimes, a preacher is called a pastor. Now, a, piece, a preacher can be a pastor, uh, an elder, a bishop. Those three words are the same thing. But it's almost like the square and the, and the rectangle. All, squ all, rectangle, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares, all right? All, all uh, some <laughs> pastors can be preachers. I've been at places where the preacher was one of the elders, pastors, bishops, whichever word you want to use. It is possible for a preacher to be one of the elders, one of the pastors, but not all preachers. For instance, I'm not a pastor. I don't meet the qualifications of a pastor, okay? The qualifications are given in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1. Now, sometimes people will call me pastor, and I understand what they're meaning. They're meaning preacher, and, and I, I don't make a big deal about it. Um, uh, eventually, one day, I will probably help that individual to realize, you know what? Just call me Albert. I'm not really, I don't really have a title, um, and, uh, and maybe even later on down the road, I'll say, and I don't meet the qualifications of a pastor. I'm not a pastor, but there's, there's bigger fish to fry. There's more things to share with someone, uh, right off the bat than to immediately, immediately come down on someone and say, I'm not a pastor. So I know what they're, I know what they're meaning. 
And so I don't worry about it at first. I don't, I don't make a big deal about it at first because what they're meaning to say is true about me. I'm a preacher, okay? That's what I am. But, but, but it's not how the word is used in the Bible. Um, an elder is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the pastor, is the bishop, okay? But let's get back to this. Okay, so I think we've looked at everything we need to about this word, especially, you know, this is one of the things I appreciate about looking at the, the word pastor. Um, <laughs> all you need is, is Psalm 23, and, you, and you've got the total idea of what a, an elder who is a pastor what his responsibility is as a shepherd, okay? As a shepherd, he is supposed to tend to the flock, tend to the sheep. Now, with that in mind, let's go to our other verse. Go with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. I want to I wanna make this connection. Don't you, believe, don't you believe me when I say all three things are talking about the same person? Believe the Bible. And I've got two different places in the, in the New Testament where all three words are used to talk about the same person. Acts chapter 20 is one of those places. Okay. The other one, by the way, is going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll be going there next. So if you're, if you're curious, if you want to get your, yourself ready, that, that's great. All right. But here in Acts chapter 20, we're going to look at verse 28. But first I want to show you, Paul talks to these, this group of people for, from verse 17 to verse 38, the rest of the chapter, 17 to 38. Look who he's talking to. Look at verse 17 of Acts 20. From Miletus, he, Paul, sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. All right? Specific, a specific group of people. A group of people that are given their qualifications uh, qualifications who can be an elder in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. All right. They are a position within God's kingdom. And I now want to show you they are the position spoken of in Ephesians chapter 4. The pastors. Look at verse 28. Speaking to the same people, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among the whole among which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops to pastor the church of God. Now, chances are, you're, if you're using the old King James Version, you probably have the word bishop there. But it's the word overseer that my newer translation has. I just threw the word bishop there, okay, just to, just to, just to show what the word means, uh, what the word is. Okay, so, so bishops to, and this is the verb form of the word for shepherd. You, 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 you are a shepherd, or you can shepherd people. But it's the same Greek word, just in the verb form. Okay? So someone who shepherds people is someone who does the things that, uh, that are mentioned in Psalm 23. All right? He's the shepherd, and he's shepherding. Shepherding people. But it's the same Greek word, just in the, just in the verb form, as opposed to the noun form. It has the same root to it. Okay? So look at what he says here. Who made these elders the bishops or overseers and shepherds of God's people? Who was it who did it? God. God. Which particular part of the Godhead is mentioned? God, Ghost, have made you overseers. Bishops. Yeah, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is who's being spoken of. So the Holy Spirit made them. Again, I appreciate the answer that was given. The answer is God. God gave the, them, those elders. God made them, the bishops. God made them, the pastors. Okay? So, here we have two more words that go along with that word pastor. We already know about the shepherding idea of God's people. Now we have a word bishop, and we have the word um, uh, elder, which started off in verse 17. Let's talk about bishop. That's, that's kind of the harder one of the, of the two. They're not, none of them are hard, but if I was going to rank one of them as the hardest between pastor, shepherd, I mean, pastor, bishop, and elder, uh, the word for bishop is a little harder because they threw in that word bishop. 
I wish the word wasn't there. <laughs> uh, it doesn't mean, I mean, maybe it meant the th same thing back in King James Day. Again, remember, this is not a religious word. Okay, those of us who are in the Air Force, we had bishops. All right, you know that, Pat? <laughs> we had bishops. Uh, of course, that word was never used. How about the word overseer? You ever have someone who is called your overseer, you know, you know, or, or your supervisor? <clears throat> that's all the word means. And that's why, and that's why the translation that Julie has up on the screen, my new American standard, has the word overseer there. It is someone who watches over a work. It is a management type position. It is, it is someone who is, is managing the work so that things are done correctly, things are done effectively, things are done as the owner would have them done, all right? However you want to say that, um, or in the Air Force terms, as, you're, as, the, as the top dog, the guy over you wants to have it done. But, you know, there are certain things that have to be done in an organization. And so the overseer, you might call him the branch chief, for instance, in our branch, is the one who makes certain things get accomplished that his bosses have told him to do. And, of course, the boss of the elder is God. We're going to be seeing that, by the way, you know, with the use of that word for shepherd again when we get to First Peter. But just take my word for it for the moment, and I think it's obvious in verse 28. They are put in position by God. And so the word merely means overseer. And I want to make some a, a couple of points about the overseer here, that so we don't forget. All right, God put him in the position, um, uh, but he's not supposed to be overbearing. It's not his church. Understand? Let me say that again. It is not his church. Quite frankly, I always uh, I'm a little bit. Um, uh, I don't like the phrase "my church." When, when, when I, I don't use it, I, I, and, I, and whenever anyone uses it, I understand what they mean. But it, no, it's God's church. And I think that's an important thing for us to note. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying the words my church, because I know what we're meaning by it. But I like, I like keeping in, my, in the front of my mind, at least, exactly who the church belongs to. And so especially, sometimes people can get a, a big head, and especially if they're in a position to make decisions for the church... They can get some kind of weird idea without even thinking about it that it's that the church belongs to them. You know, you know, the purpose of a, a, a manager of God's kingdom is to make sure God's kingdom works correctly, is doing what is best for the work as opposed to what he wants. Understand something. Sometimes because of that fact. Sometimes an elder needs to realize that that what he wants is not is not what is best for the group. What's going to help the group the best, what's going to help the group to grow better, may be something that he would prefer not to do <laughs> or that he thinks he has a better idea. But no. Uh, first off, if it goes against God's way of doing things, obviously he, he can't be doing that. But secondly, if, it, if there's something better, even though he doesn't want to do it that way, he needs to be doing it that way because he is the manager. His, his purpose is to get the job done the most effective way, the most, the most um, appreciated, perhaps, way among the congregation. It's not going to cause any stumbling blocks and, it, and the most effective way, all right? We see the same thing within God's, within God's house, God's family, okay? Uh, God's, God's word makes it clear, and this is going to be a study for some other time. My, my, these words might get me in trouble with some other people. But God's word ten makes minutes. it clear. Uh, ten minutes, thank you. God's word makes it clear that the, the husband is the head of the household. But in making decisions for the household, sometimes the wife is going to have a better idea. Well, what a fool that man is. If he does it the way he wants to do it, as opposed to the way that's better to do it. Okay, and that's, that's a discussion I oftentimes have when I'm doing premarital counseling on that idea. But he, it, it, the best thing for the family needs to be what's on the, the mind of the, 
of, of the husband's, of the father's mind, not what's best for him. Sometimes it's going to be exactly what he doesn't want to do, but it's the best thing for the family. And that's the point. Same thing with elders. Once the elders get the idea that they are, they are the ones, they are the man, they are, they are in charge, that things are going to be done the right way now because I'm here and I'm going to do it and I'm going to be happy because they're going to be done my way. He's got the wrong attitude. Okay. That's lording it over. That's lording. Very good. Well, let me take that phrase since I've only got 10 minutes anyway and take it to our next set of verses. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5. I want us to see that word, that word overseer used again. And I want us to see that that word overseer and the word for shepherd is being used in connection with the elders here in chapter 5. Did you know that Peter the Apostle was an elder? Okay? Okay? And it, here Peter is writing to a group of Christians, and he and he tells them, I'm an elder, you know? Now, understand something. The qualifications of an elder that are given in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1, Make it clear that the elder is supposed to be married. Well, remember when Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law? Peter was married. Okay? Uh, so, so the idea of him being an elder is most certainly true. Paul the Apostle, on the other hand, makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 7 that he isn't married. Paul the Apostle couldn't be an, an elder. As much as he's inspired by God's word, as much as he would probably make a good one, as much as he he might have might have in fact many ways better quali better attitude perhaps at times than Peter the apostle than Peter, Peter could be an elder because he held the qualification. Paul the apostle could not. It doesn't matter if he's a, he if he would make a great one. Right? If it was if you you question me, I'd probably say Paul would make a great elder, but uh, he wasn't qualified. But look at what we see here in, in, in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through, oh, verse 4. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness the sufferings of Christ and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight. Look at there, we got the two words there, the Greek words. Okay, the, that the the verb form for for pastor again or shepherd, but they are to shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not with compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, and yet. I'm sorry, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge. This is the phrase a moment ago that Bob brought up. They are not lord they should not be lording it over. I'm in power, I'm in control. Things are gonna be done my way from now on. I don't care about the rest of you. Whatever y'all the rest of you think. We're doing it this way. No. That's not the job of the elder. The elder is to do it the best way. His job is, what's that? Okay. His job is to do it the best way. His job is to do it in a way that's not going to be causing strife among God's people. Quite frankly, in God's word, whenever, when Jesus said, remember when Jesus said to his apostles, one of them wanted to sit on his right hand, the other one wanted to sit on the left hand. Uh, uh, find that verse for me, Julie. I'm, I'm not remembering where that is. Where, where, where he said those two things, um, he told them, no, the, the, the one who is greatest among you will be your servant, the one who serves the most, okay? And so when we, when we consider being in a job of, a, of, of responsibility, that's why I call it responsibility. I don't, it's, not a, it's not a job of, of prestige. Quite frankly, the, higher, the, the, the closer you get up to God in responsibility, the more you serve, there's no bigger servant in God's church than Jesus Christ, than God the Father, who has been working from the very beginning of time until now to be able to, to, be able to get people right with him. He's been serving. He's, he's a servant, all right? He's God. Don't get me wrong about that. He's God. 
But the higher you go on the responsibility chain, the more you need to be serving the rest. So it's not a job of prestige. They are people that we should we should hold in hold in honor for what they're doing for us. Where is that? Mark chapter ten. Yeah, yeah. Mark, Mark chapter in, ten. Beginning at thirty-seven. Yeah, starting in verse thirty-seven is where we see that the one who's going to be greatest among you will be the servant. Okay. Yeah, it goes on down to verse verses uh, forty-one through forty-five is the, basically the place I was wanting. Yeah. But you see, you see that idea. Verse 43, the one who's going to be great among you will be your servant. If you're one to serve, and he goes on to say, for the son of man did not come to be to be served, but to serve and give his life. That's why the position of an elder is one who is not to be served. He's there to serve. He should be the biggest servant within the congregation because he has the responsibility to oversee the work, but he is he is a servant. Now, I'm running out of time, I know. I'm sorry, did someone say something? Yeah, Albert, there's, yeah. there's one other thing that's pointed out in uh, 2 Peter verse five and, uh, uh, chapter 5 and verse 2, is that they are, to, they are to take care of the flock among them. That is, that's the one congregation, in other words. Yeah. They're yeah, not that... responsible for another. As you mentioned, the Air Force and my TI was only responsible for the actions of my squadron. There you go. Not somebody else's squadron. Yeah, yeah, it's not the same thing with elders. Right, right. When I was in the Air Force, our branch chief was not supposed to be bossing around people in other organizations telling them how to do their job. He takes care of where he's right. at. That's the same idea. That's the same idea with the with the elder here. Okay. The elder is over the congregation that the Holy Spirit is the God has put in his charge. All right. Not so, a plurality of elders or a plurality of congregations. Right. But one congregation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and so, yeah, that's, that's, but anyway, I'm, I'm running out of time for my last word. So let me get my last word in. We may have to go into tomorrow. We'll see. How am I doing on time, Julie? Uh, less than two minutes. Okay. Let me just mention the other word then. All right. So we've already looked at the shepherd is supposed to take care of the flock. The pastor is supposed to take care of the flock, make certain they're getting their feeding, make certain they are protected. You know, uh, and obviously everything involved with God's word in that regard. The, uh, the, the same person who is the bishop is to oversee the operation of the congregation and to make certain everything is being done smoothly, make certain everything is being done, obviously, according to God's will, make certain that the, the best way of doing things is, is happening so that the congregation is able to grow, is able to, is able to do what God has given that congregation, all congregations to do. And then the, and that last one is elder. Have you ever had two young men come to your door and tell you, I'm elder so-and-so and I'm elder so-and-so, <laughs> you know? Um, well, they don't meet the qualification of an elder. And I don't mean the qualifications given, they don't meet some of the qualifications given in 1 Timothy 3 or, or uh, Titus chapter 1 either. But an elder is an older man. I'm sorry, I don't care. Uh, you, you would have to have a very uh, young society to have someone who's 21 to be an older man. All right. Um, they, they pretty much fall on the scale of the younger people of the of the of the world. All right. And so that word elder really means older man. And I think we are going to go into the discussion next uh, tomorrow with this and maybe then go into the word deacon, which is another position within God's church. But you've gotten the three you've gotten the three words. You've gotten overseer or bishop. You've gotten pastor or shepherd and you've gotten elder or older man. That's all the word means. Let's go to God in a word of prayer and we'll, we'll be done for today. And if you have any questions, make certain to ask them tomorrow. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word. Please help us, Father, to see the connection between these three words and the individual, individuals that they are speaking of, that, they are, that this shows us exactly what uh, one who is in the position of elder in your, your church is supposed to be. Please help us, Father, always to understand that and always to grow closer to your word. Defeat us, Father, in anything we're teaching that's not correct. Help us, help us to see the correct situation, what your word is trying to show us. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen.
Thank you all. Appreciate you being here.